Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to yet another cracking installment of the Map Round Show. Today, we're going to be talking about startups. We're going to be talking about customer discovery, product development, and we're going to be doing all of that with probably one of the leading opinion makers or influencers in the space to date. Uh, his name is Steve Blank. Steve, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Uh, Steve, uh, for our viewers and uh, listeners around the world who potentially haven't been in the tech space or maybe they haven't heard of you and the kind of uh, impact that you've had on the world stage, um, why don't you give us the elevator pitch, kick us off, what do we need to know? Well, uh, I was a serial entrepreneur for uh, uh, more time than I'm uh, afraid to mention, uh, did eight startups, uh, and then when I retired, I started thinking about the nature of innovation and entrepreneurship and uh, discovered that what investors had been telling us was simply all wrong. I mean, every bit of it is that startups weren't smaller versions of large companies. Um, large companies uh, execute a known business model, but startups search for them. And we had no tools to do that. And so uh, I invented a process called uh, uh, customer development that is uh, based around the idea that there are no facts inside the building, so get the hell outside. Um, and that turned into something called the Lean Startup Method. Uh, my work, Eric Reese's work, and Alexander Osterwalder's work. It's how startups now build uh, new ventures. Great stuff. Thank you for that, Steve. Um, so did we, did we fit in an elevator? <laughs> we can now. <laughs> That's a great pitch. Clearly, you've been in startups for a long time. <laughs> Uh, but um, yeah, on a serious note though, where did it all go wrong? Because obviously, if you cast your mind back to when you first founded your first company, obviously you founded many, many companies uh, which we can get into and the lessons thereof. But you know, if, if you cast your mind back to that time, there wasn't really a lot of business model tools out there. Um, I mean, outside of the, the business plan. Obviously, you've changed all of that. Um, but if you cast your mind back to the beginning, like I often get asked, you know, uh, by um, like it's literally every week, should I do a business plan? Yes or no. Um, and I have my view on that. But is the business plan still a valuable exercise? And, and where does the relationship to planning uh, come into uh, in the context of, you know, the lean startup method? Those are all great questions. Um, and, and let me start at the beginning. Um, you know, uh, it, tools for for businesses were not engraved on the pyramids. Um, you know, the formal methodologies came with the rise of business schools, which are only about 100 years old or maybe 110 years old. Harvard in the United States graduated its first class in 1908. Um, and, and basically, if you remember what they were graduating, were masters of business administration. Not business startups, but administration. That is, there were a need for professionals on how to manage existing companies that were growing fairly rapidly. And that caught on in Europe and the rest of the world. Um, and they spent 100 years building tools and techniques for administration, for execution, as I say, of existing businesses. Um, and when startups came along, uh, and, and it's not like startups popped in you know, last year, they've always been around, but they were always treated as individual inventors or or something else. It wasn't until the rise of uh, professional venture capital, that is people who would take risks on, on new ventures as a profession and that started as an asset class. Most of those people were finance people and MBAs. So they kind of fell back onto what they were familiar with, which was, well, give me a five-year forecast. Show me your income statement, balance sheet and cash flow for the next five years. I remember doing that and I remember, wait a minute, my income statement says zero, 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 and my balance sheet is going to be negative for a long time. So why are they asking me for this? And the answer is they didn't know what else to ask. There was nothing else. It was a divide by zero problem. So you would say, well, why didn't they figure out, you know, we need a different set of tools. And, and I, what I'm about to say is not a pejorative. It's just a fact is, well, if they were entrepreneurs, they would be starting companies, not running venture firms. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're, again creative finance people, not creative innovators. And so it really took a long time for people to realize that number one, no business plan survives first contact with customers. In fact, most VCs, even by the time I'm a venture capitalist, even by the time I was an entrepreneur would tell you, yeah, you know, you write this down, but by the time you actually have some liquidity event, 
you know, your company looks nothing like the plan we wrote, but we're going to make you write it anyway. And the answer was, because we really didn't know what else to write. I, I, I don't know if that's a good enough answer, but it's simply because there was nothing else. It was, it was all based on the experience of MBAs and finance people who were used to growing and managing large corporations. I remember, by the way, as an aside, when I came up with this notion of maybe we need something else, I went to the some serious people in, in a couple of business schools that will uh, became maybe will go unmentioned, except they're on one on the East Coast and the other on the West Coast of the United States, who literally patted me on the head and said, son, how hard could six people in a garage be? I consult for companies with 100,000 people. Not understanding that six people in a garage have very different needs than 100,000 people. And then when I realized we were just talking way past each other because uh, I was living in a world they had no idea what the chaos and uncertainty looked like. We just had a series of unknowns when they had a series of knowns. They yeah. knew customers and channel and distribution and competitors. We were discovering them every day. Yeah, that's right, true. That's enough, that's enough of a new, I think, soliloquy, and we could, no, we could no. answer more. There's a lot that you're saying, Steve, that I resonate with. Specifically, um, you know, I, I founded 14 startups over the last 20 years. I've had multiple exits. Um, and uh, But what I've learned is, is like in this whole founder sort of story and, and journey is that I oftentimes wind up with a business I didn't intend to start. And it's because of trying to find the problem that the market actually has and then building the product or the services or essentially the value proposition around the problem um, while you are almost, you know, it's like the old analogy of like a startup, like a, in a plane in the air and you kind of, you know, building the, the engine as you're going. It's that same sort of analogy, which I know you've heard many, many times over. Um, because, you know, and the, if I think about the times that I failed, like a lot of those startups didn't see, you know, they saw the light of day and then unfortunately, you know, didn't, uh, didn't scale. Um, and the reason uh, for that is that I was just so, especially when I was younger, I was so, um, I, this is the problem. You know, like I wasn't interested in talking to the customer as much as I should have. And over the years, I matured and I learned that actually what I think is the problem that the world has isn't what the world thinks the problem is. And it's about this perspective shift to say, okay, I'm not the one that's actually in charge. The customer is in charge. Um, and so when you have this kind of empathetic approach to building a value proposition, that's when things start to, to happen. When, you know, as an example, we niched down into the tech space. We, we, we had to be, have, be courageous to choose a customer. We didn't want to, we couldn't be everyone to, or in everything to everyone because we were essentially invisible. So we had to choose. And when we chose, we niched down and we started to scale. And that's when exponential stuff started to happen. That's when we started to really intimately understand the problem. So if you really think about it, is that what you just said is that, well, most entrepreneurs believe they're visionaries on day one. Uh, data says over 90% of them are actually hallucinating. Um, <laughs> so, but, but really the ones that succeed, so let's go follow, the, follow that a little deeper. The ones that succeed actually get out of the building, gather some facts and do something which, which founders could do, but large companies find really hard is they pivot. That is, a pivot is defined as substantive evidence about one or more parts of the business model that, that is wrong, whether you're the wrong customer, wrong product features, wrong channel, wrong pricing, wrong whatever, that you get enough customer data and you have the permission and agility to kind of change what you're doing. Now, I have to tell you, that is now an, an integral part of this lean method, but that would have gotten you fired, fired in the 20th century. And in fact, I've seen it happen multiple times. What happened in the past is you would write a plan, uh, you would present it to potential funders, venture capitalists, they would give you uh, money, and you were told to execute the plan. And so you hired engineering, and believe it or not, you hired head of sales and head of marketing and maybe head of biz dev. And in the engineering group would go through what's called alpha test, beta test, first customer ship, that is building the product and maybe building prototypes of it, but they really weren't interested in customer feedback if the product got outside the building at all. They were interested in bug feedback. That is, did the product work? But, but of course, customers are going to love it because it said so right here in the plan. I gave you money. And basically what happened is you'd get ready to have a giant party for what was called first customer ship. And because that was the date you told your investors or, and then your spreadsheet says revenue would 
would show up here. And in fact, the only problem you thought you were going to have is the building big enough to hold the bags of money that were going to come. Um, and here's what really happened. Here's the funny thing. And, and this, this happened time and again is you would ship the product and nine times out of 10, customers didn't behave like your business plan said. So, you know, months would go by and, and you'd have board meetings and the VP of sales would have to say, well, you know, revenue's coming or, you know, we're going to make it and whatever. And then after a while, they'd fire the VP of sales. Well, that's interesting. They hire a new VP of sales. What do you think the new VP of sales did? You think they did the exact same thing the last one did? No, they said, oh, that, that guy was an idiot. And back then they were all guys. Then they'd say, oh, let's try something new. Well, what you didn't realize is that that was our first pivot. The only way we were allowed to pivot was we fired somebody. And by the way, six months later would pass and its revenue still isn't coming. Guess who they'd fire next? That was me, the VP of marketing. <laughs> and so the new marketing person would come in and go, oh, that positioning was all wrong. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, and what you just did, by the way, is another pivot. And then, you know, this would continue. And then they fire the CEO. And if he or she was so important, you'd become CTO or, you know, chief strategy, whatever. But the new CEO would go, oh, everybody was an idiot. And again, you would, you would only pivot when you had permission because you fired a new person. Think about what the lean startup says. The lean startup says, we assume on day one, here's the big idea. All we have is a series of untested hypotheses, which is a really fancy word for we're just effing guessing. Yeah. We're guessing because we're smart and because we think we have a vision. But let's just assume that everything we've just said on day one is a set of hypotheses that we need to test. Not to build you know, a $100 million factory, we're just going to like build what's what we call minimum viable products. That is, we're going to build wireframes or prototypes or test pricing or test, you know, like distribution channel, et cetera. Instead of just building this massive edifice and hiring tons of people and building an entire sales force, we're going to rapidly, as fast as we can, test those things out. That's a radical difference between what startups do today, or at least the successful ones, and what we used to do in the 20th century. That's also the, also the distinction between a startup and a large company. In a large company, you hire more people every day because you have an existing model that's successful. Customers are already buying. You have factories that, that work. You know what supply chain looks like, et cetera. So you could execute more and faster without actually being wrong on a day-to-day -day basis. That's not true in a startup in its early days. Does that match your experience? It, it does. It does very much. I mean, I think I'm, I'm, I'm really digesting what you're saying and I'm trying to reflect on the experience that I've had, especially where I failed. And um, I, I had a question I was going to explore with you anyway, and maybe I'll just do it now, but why do startups fail? Because there's obviously a lot of reasons for that. Um, but, but one of the biggest drivers of value is the ability to commercialize. So if, you, if you're able to, uh, as you pointed out, build an, an MVP or minimum, you know, what's the other word? That's a minimum viable Yeah, minimum viable product. But there's also like this idea of the minimum exceptional product. You know, it's like yep. every, everybody's looked at the stuff and said, well, you know, how, what's my point of view on it? But, but really at the end of the day, it's about um, having a, a, or problem market fit even. You know, it's about the journey yep. between MVP and product market fit and saying, okay, how fast can I commercialize that? Because if you can't commercialize it fast enough and your revenues are, or your OPEX is going up and your you know, obviously revenue is coming down, you can't swallow the fish, the thing dies. Uh, but I'd love to get your view. I mean, obviously there's lots of considerations here, uh, but in your experience, Steve, having obviously you teach at Berkeley and Stanford all about this, uh, this method that you've developed, the lean startup method, uh, but why do startups fail today? Like what is the number one reason if you were to hang your hat on something, what is that thing? Well, you know, I call uh, I, I call failure the nine deadly sins. So let me start with uh, number one. And and we've been talking about it a, a bit, but it's number one is assuming you know what the customer wants. That's a big idea. And and think about it. Every great entrepreneur starts with passion. You know, I want to build X or I want to deliver Y and I want to, you know, solve X and let's put a team together and let's raise money because this is going to be it. And by the way, if you don't have that passion, I don't care what kind of methodology you have, it's not going to work, my friend. It's, but so, so that passion is also a double-edged sword because you have to believe on day one, 
a startup is actually a faith-based enterprise. It's a religious activity um, <laughs> because you need to create a reality distortion field. You need to believe in the unknown and that magic will happen. But at the same time, the number one trap is that belief gets you into this kind of deadly embrace of you believe implicitly, implicitly, because people don't usually force you to say, so what problem do you think you're solving? Mm. Or what need do you think the customer has? Well, no, I'm going to build X and Y, and here's what we're going to get. No, no, no. What problem or, or what need do you think this will fulfill? No, no, let me show you the features. Here's the demo. And, what, and, and then you go, no, no, no. Humor me. <clears throat> Just tell me, why will they buy? And then they go, well, I think they have this problem. Mm -hmm. Boy, now we're on the step to kind of survival. Because then we could say, humor me again. Why don't we get out and see if anybody shares your belief about that problem? Because great, passionate founders implicitly think they understand the problem. And here's the trick. They've jumped to the solution without ever even articulating what that problem is. So that's step. That's problem one of the nine de deadly sins of, of uh, startup failure. Is that a book that's coming out, Steve, or have you written that already? <laughs> We've, I've written a, a two books. Uh, one, uh, The Four Steps to the Epiphany. If you want to see the Ur text, that is the one that kicked off the whole lean startup movement. It was the that was the Emperor has no clothes book um, uh, that kind of at the turn of the century kicked it off when when the when the scales were falling off from my eyes, going wait a minute, <laughs> I think everybody's wrong. And yeah. but the but the handbook, the kind of execution book uh, I wrote uh, uh, over a decade ago now with Bob Dorf, is called the Startup Owner's Manual, and it is literally what it sounds. If you're a if you're a startup and you want to at least have a step by step guide on how to build a either a hardware physical goods or or web mobile uh, company, uh, there's that book as well, which takes the theory into practice about um, how to do that in in every step, which was a hoot writing because uh, by the time I wrote the book, the difference between the the first book and the second book is that in the first one there was just me who believed it, and then Eric Reese believed it, and then, by the time the second book came out, um, all of Silicon Valley had adopted it without having a book. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> it was, yeah, and, and now, by the way, just, just to put it in context, literally, you know, when I wrote the first book, there was no one writing about this. There must be a thousand or more books about lean something or lean yeah. UX or lean, which is awesome yeah. because it turned out, you know, it turned out two decades later, instead of a fad, there are really some fundamental truths here. And people have done a great job building on top of it and, and you know, branching off and whatever. But it, but it seems to be that it get out of the building, customer discovery, MVPs, you know, pivots, uh, failure versus, um, uh, versus no risk, et cetera, are all an integral part about how we build innovation uh, ecosystems and companies and, and whatever. Um, but so to answer your question, that... <laughs> The Startup Owner's Manual is probably, for your listeners, a good place to start. Cool. I brought it up on screen while uh, you were talking. So if you haven't uh, read that Startup Owner's Manual, guys, go pick it up on Amazon. Um, Steve, one, if I could share a personal story with you, because uh, I think it's quite relevant to what you what you believe and, and the experience that I've had. Um, Steve, um, I I have... Um, in the past, uh, like let's, I can actually talk about my most recent, most successful company. It's called Digital Kung Fu. So we're a pipeline generation business for tech companies, Microsoft, Oracle, IBM, all these guys. Um, and um, and what actually happened was when when we pivoted towards the problem, like I, I guess maybe if I can go back, I was super passionate, right? I was like so passionate about founding companies. I still am to this day. I love uh, like just starting something new and writing copy for web pages. Crazy, but I love that. Uh, because it's brand new and you get excited about that thing. Um, and then inevitably what you have to do is try and figure out, well, what is the, there's a vision for the thing, but actually that might not be what, um, what the market is actually looking to buy. And so you have to pivot to the problem. And so what I've heard on this podcast and what other entrepreneurs in my network have experienced and myself personally is that sometimes, Steve, when you pivot to uh, a new problem, it's actually a problem that you don't like solving. And so what happens is, is that, or in my experience, the worst thing that I can, I can own is a business or an asset that I hate. Um, and, you know, it's like, oh, God, I'm going to have to get out of bed today, you know. Um, so I'd love to maybe get you to 
put, you know, paint a picture on this? Like, how do we avoid this? Like, when do we pull the plug on the vision and say, hey, I'm going to pump the brakes on this one? Or when do we go, you know, I'm a capitalist. I'm just going to do this thing anyway. I don't care how much it sucks. Well, it, it's very funny you say that, but the largest crater I had was for a, a company I started and six months into it, I realized I hated my customers. <laughs> um, and, and no, no, seriously, I, I had spent my career uh, working on fairly high tech products, whether they were, I did two semiconductor companies, supercomputers, enterprise software. And, and six months into this company, I, I was the CEO of a video game company selling to 14 year old boys who wanted to kill stuff. <laughs> and I realized, <laughs> what the hell? I used to be a 14 year old boy, but I was just selling to literally rocket scientists with PhDs at Boeing, the last company. <laughs> and, and, and I have to tell you just from personal experience and, and your conversation is your, your introduction is that the minute you wake up hating your customers or not liking them, you ought to update your resume and leave because that has a set of interesting effects. It's not only do you grudgingly get out of bed, you implicitly don't want to talk to them a lot. Mm. That is, you're not enjoying that interaction. And when you stop enjoying that interaction, you stop hearing about what they say and what they think and what whatever. And that ability to find product market fit radically diminishes because you're getting further and further away from the data. Worse, because you personally won't like it, you'll think you could kind of outsource customer discovery to like a head of sales or head of marketing. And then you'll kind of like, when they bring in bad news, you'll kind of go, oh, they don't just get it yet. <laughs> and like, and, and the thing ends up in a death spiral. So, so uh, from personal experience, um, you know, if, if, if you can, I, I would remember that like um, founders get multiple shots at the goal. You know, we have a special word for a failed entrepreneur when you're in an innovation cluster. Do you know what that name is? What the word is for failed entrepreneur? No. Exper experience. Oh, really? It, it's a big, no, think about it. It's a big idea that in, in innovation clusters, not every place in the world, but places that value innovators and founders and fund them, et cetera. You know, if you have an honest failure, you haven't shamed your family or your community or, or you know, they're not going to come after you with baseball bats to break your kneecaps to pay back the money. Mm. They'll fund you again. Mm. I mean, that's why in innovation clusters, great founders get to do multiple startups, not just one. And then if you fail, you know, like they ask you when, when you're having your first coffee after your company's cratered or you left. So what are you going to do next? Mm. Instead of like, you owe me the money back. That's a big idea. And that, and and the reason why I'm saying that is that that should make founders a little more invulnerable when they're thinking about is this the wrong thing to do or should I shut this down? That is, instead of saying this is my only thing in the in my entire life, you should realize that this may not work. Most startups actually fail, unlike the you know great war stories and great heroes we write about, etc. You, you know. No one would tune into podcasts that say, well, let me tell you about the 700 failures this week. But that's that's true. Um, and so to answer your question, uh, you know, you have to figure out personally what your stamina time frame is. Mine happened to be three and a half years. Um, that is, I would stick it out, you know, that long. And nowadays I see my students going, are you out of your mind? Mine's 18 months. And and there is kind of a minimum. I mean, leaving a job or leaving uh, your own company after a year or two. Eh. But after that, if you tried your best, you know what? You know, it's time to do something else. Either give up, give, give the money back or find a new CEO or just, you know, talk to your investors or whatever. Hmm. On the other hand, I've worked with, a co with a, someone in a previous company who went off and you know, stuck at it for 12 years. We called them the flying Dutchman of Silicon Valley. Um, until, in fact, I, we were all felt sorry for him. I mean, he had a company of like 400 people and then he got it down to just him and his wife and his patents until one day I was reading the Intel annual report and there was a footnote that said patent settlement for MicroUnity, $545 million. He had sued Intel, and after 12 years, he actually made a half a billion dollars. But I got to tell you, in that time, I did four startups. Um, and I wouldn't have traded my experience with his, even though he made, you know, 10x more money. 
because he had a miserable time for, for you know, nine of those 12 years where I just had an, an enormous adventure. So the answer to your short question was, it depends. You know, you just can't cut and run, but, it, but there's no, life isn't fun if you have to get up and drag yourself into work, particularly if you're an entrepreneur. Did I answer your question? You did. You did. You did very well. It's it's I'm like it's it's, it's ringing the old uh, bringing all cobwebs out of my old uh, failures. <laughs> uh, specifically, you know, like I think what we're touching on is really important because we're really talking about when you look at or from my perspective, if you think about the lean uh, startup method, it's a it's a methodology that um, uses failure to get you ultimately to success faster through rapid you know iterations of failure. And what's interesting from an inner game perspective, from, an, from a human perspective, is that, I don't know how, how it is in America necessarily, but certainly here where I was raised, failure is not cool. Um, it's not, um, it's like a societal uh, conditioning principle or value that yep. is, is taught to you at school, like failure is bad. Like in other words, if I'm at school, I must do a maths test and it was always like, no, you must get good grades. You must be an A student. And if you're a C student, like, like I was totally average, <laughs> like totally average. I know you dropped out of uh, out of uh, college as well, uh, but um, you know, like it was just like I, I wasn't cut out for the whole for the whole space. But in my mind, failure is bad. And when my when I lost my first company, I, in fact, I was actually lucky. My first company was a record label. I was very young, first company, and I got lucky. I sold the thing. Uh, but my next um, business failed, and I was young. I was twenty six years old. I thought I was a rock star, and actually, really, the, the universe is going to fix that all for me. Um, and so when I failed, I took that so personally, like it was really, really bad. Like I went to negative town, I got depressed, like, I, you know, crying emotionally. And I was like, I was financially and spiritually broken. It was like failure sucked for me. Um, and now what's really interesting talking to you here some 25 years later is how important failure actually is. It's a prerequisite to success, you know. Um, and, and even the idea that we touched on earlier about business, a uh, business plan was the only tool we had like 20, 30 years ago, right? And it came from like business people and MBA and what have you. Um, and now we're sitting in a situation where we have tools that actually encourages failure and the faster to failure you get, the more success you're likely to have. Um, so I want to touch just on failure with you. What is your relationship to failure now? And what advice do you have to a founder who is listening to us right now going, you know, I'm on the, the verge of failing. So, so let me separate out failure from how to deal with failure. Um, so anybody who's telling you that failure is good, obviously has never failed. <laughs> it's a pretty effing miserable experience. Um, and th that the goal of lean is to accelerate failure. That's bullshit. That is absolutely wrong. The goal of lean is to accelerate learning and discovery. And that's a key distinction. And in accelerate learning and discovery, you in fact realize that failure is one of the consequences. And if you're in an innovation cluster, it is not career ending, but trust me, it does not feel good. Um, and, and so if, if we understand that the goal is to learn and discover as rapidly as possible, and that failure and, and discovering is, failure might be one of those artifacts, then you understand where failure fits. But, but let's say you are failing or your company is going out of business or you have failed, that's a separate conversation. It's how do you deal with that as an individual and et cetera. And, and for me, um, I went through six stages of failure. And if I can, I'll share with you. Please, uh, yeah. You know, one of my, my next to last company, oh, it was great. We were on the cover of something called Wired Magazine. And, you know, here we yeah. were with the superstars and whatever. I think it was called, the company was called Rocket Science and it was great as Hollywood meets Silicon Valley. Um, this is that video game company I mentioned that I hated my customers. Um, but, but the, you know, I went through six steps. And the first one was like when I realized 90 days after I was on the cover of Wired, um, you know, it was like shock and surprise. It's like, how can this happen? Like we had 120 people and, you know, but our game sucked. <laughs> like, you know, like no one wanted to buy them. I, this can't be happening to me. I mean, it was just like surprise. Uh, and, and then... The second stage was denial. Um, and not only general denial, but deny, because I was CEO, deny that any of it was my fault. Um, hey, I was doing everything the VCs asked me to do. Me and my co-founder split up the, the business and I was raising money and doing the marketing and see, isn't that great? And well, But it wasn't my fault. 
even though my business card said CEO. Yeah. And then stage three was get angry and blame everybody else. Um, you know, hey, you know, like it was my head of game designs problem or, you know, it wasn't me or it wasn't, it was the VCs who refused to give me any more money. It was all their fault. And then when all this came crashing down, stage four was I got depressed. Um, and for three weeks, I would go home and go to bed at 4.30 p.m. And my wife said, Steve, it's a sign of depression. And I went, no, 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 everything's fine. I'm just really tired. <laughs> um, and I lost interest in anything associated with my past industry. By the way, two decades later, I still can't look at a video game. I mean, really? truly, that's how wow. profound it was. But here's the redemption part. And, and I said there are six steps. Step five was, you know, I gradually accepted my role in the failure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All this other stuff and all these other people. Yeah, they were participants in it. My business card said CEO. I owned it. And unless I was going to embrace owning it, you know, what I didn't, the things I didn't listen to or when I didn't act or what was my own role or when I should have been prepared to do the right thing or leave. And, you know, this was hard and it didn't happen overnight. And my wife was a really good partner here. And I all, often reverted to stages two and three, blame others or <laughs> deny it, et cetera. But here's the interesting thing. It turned into the lean startup. Mm -hmm. That is stage six was I got insight and I changed my behavior. And that was a big idea. This was the hardest part. And, you know, when I stopped blaming others, understanding what I could have changed in my behavior um, took months. Um, you know, it would have been easier just to move on. And most people do. Well, I've moved on. Um, you know, I was at this stage in my life where I was actually looking for the lessons that would make my next startup successful. And so I looked at the patterns of behavior, not just at my last company, but across my entire career. And I learned how to dial back hubris, uh, get other smart people to work with me instead of for me, um, you know, listen better and act and do what was right, regardless of what others thought. Um, and so that's six stages of, you know, as I said, it's okay because you're an experienced entrepreneur when you fail and yeah, people would have given me money, but we never would have gotten that, the lean startup method uh, unless I actually had time to reflect and think about some of them, not only the personal lessons, but the business lessons. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess the biggest idea is don't get stuck in stages, you know, two, three or four that is depressed or blame others or whatever. And don't skip acceptance of uh, your own role and, you know, get to insight about changing your behavior and commit to doing it right the next time. Does mm. that make sense at all? It Sorry does. about that. <coughs> no, not at you all. It, it, lecture it, in, in two minutes. No, no, that's great. Um, it actually makes perfect sense to me, Steve. So, like, for instance, like, if you blame someone, you absorb yourself of all responsibility. It's their fault. Right. So I'm cool. But actually, to your point, you're the CEO. So actually, you're always at cause. And this is the thing. When I was young, I, it was it, it was also like ah, blaming other things. I was the market, and da, da, no one wants to take life uh, <laughs> advice about life from a twenty six year old. You know that's the reason. But if I just stuck with it, and you know, if you persevere at something, as you know, Steve, like you know, success can happen at any time. Uh, but um, there's no excuse. Re there's a, well, put it this way: there's a thousand reasons not to do something, but you, know, you need to find one to keep going. Uh, and it can it doesn't need to be the why you can just it can be this reason today and every other day it's a different reason as long as you find one reason to to keep going so a lot of what you said um, resonates with me what I've also um, learned uh, Steve is is what in my experience anyway is um, is a founding team because it is important to um, you know have a have a team around you you know to help you succeed um, and I wanted to maybe ask you uh, Steve um, looking back at all the the startups you've consulted with, all the students that you, you know, that you teach on, on any given day. Um, what, in your mind now, characterizes a great founding team? What does that look like? Yeah, and uh, so I'll, I'm going to describe that in a second, but I want to back up a, uh, just yeah. a little. Sure, um, go for it. If, if you're a founder and you can't recruit a great team, as defined as people equal to or better than you, then you probably shouldn't be starting that company. It's a big idea. Yeah. Uh, so we'll talk about the team, but but a key characteristic of a successful founder is that they have what Steve Jobs used to call reality distortion field. That is, they could paint a vision that excite people enough to get them to stop doing what they're doing and do what you want them to do. Whether it's to see 
the potential of a, of a company that's going to exist and, and change the world to get co-founders and other people to join, to, to convince investors to give you money when all you have are nine slides and you raise $10 million, my last startup. <laughs> like We don't know what they're doing, but it sounds so good. We still don't understand it. Um, or even better to get customers to commit to a buggy, unfinished or or maybe non-existent product and give you, you know, millions of dollars or get millions of people to commit to it. So number one is part of part of the team is the ability to attract world-class people because you're articulate enough to, to be able to describe that sitting on the hill. And when you do that, the question is, what do you want to have as a team and how should you work together? Um, you know, I've always found that what works best is complementary skills. Um, you know, it used to be, at least back in the United States, it, you know, that used to be a bunch of white guys who all went to the same school or, or somewhere else. Um, nowadays, I think we have enough data that says a diverse team, not just different colors, but, you know, women and, and different mindset, et cetera, actually make a much more interesting team. But you have to be the CEO who's willing to, to hear other opinions, but be able to figure out how to move those opinions together rather than turn it into a debating society. You know, in my experience is at least a third of startups uh, melt down before they get to a series A because of the, uh, or even a seed round because of founder disagreements. Um, so one is to, to find not only complementary skills, but complementary work ethics. You know, I've been in startups where the, some of the founders were single, you know, in their 20s, willing to work and sleep under the desks, while a couple of them had children um, and a young family. And boy, you know, you either have to bet on your company or bet on your family. And, and uh, you know, that creates an impedance mismatch. Um, not that there's a right answer, but you need to understand everybody's both alignment and time commitment um, and passion and amount of work and, and an amount of competence. Because uh, again, half the time you discover that the that maybe your co-founder wasn't as great as you thought, or mm. worse. And I see this happen all the time. The classic is uh, at Apple, Wozniak versus Jobs. This is Apple would never have happened without Wozniak. But um, you know, four years later, or even three years later, it had grown way past him. He was still the honored technical co-founder, but you know, the company was like now in a much different place. Mm. Um, and then the last part I'll mention is, at least for tech startups, um, there's at minimum two different types of co-founders. One is the innovator. Um, and the innovator might be the inventor, again, the Wozniak to, to, to Jobs or, the, uh, or uh, uh, Paul Allen to Bill Gates. And the other is the crazy entrepreneur who may or may not be technical. Jobs couldn't really code for his, neither could Bill Gates. I mean, they thought they could, but no, not really. Um, <laughs> Or even Elon Musk versus uh, Tesla, J.B. Straubel. Everybody's heard of Elon, but there would have been no company without Straubel, uh, who was the, the CTO. And almost every company at its core has an innovator and an entrepreneur. The entrepreneur creates the reality distortion field, makes it look larger than life, et cetera. The innovator is the one that creates the product and technology. And usually you have other complementary uh, uh, skills. Uh, every, every once in a while, you could have a, a single founder. I mean, it's not impossible. But behind that PR of a single founder usually is a founding team. Yeah. Did I answer your question? You did. You did 100%. You did 100%. It's interesting because I'm busy selling my, exiting my businesses now. I'm moving to the States. And so I'm thinking about already the next thing, you know. <laughs> and so who would I want to take with me? Um, and it's what you've described around that dynamic. The guy I have in mind, I won't mention who he is, but the guy I have in mind is is very product innovation led. And I'm I'm a sales guy. Like I can sell anything, <laughs> literally anything. Um, and so I think what you're describing is that that kind of dynamic is, is really first prize. That's kind of what I heard. Yes. And, that, um, and, and, and founding teams go through different iterations as they scale. Um, and by the way, that's also true for the founding CEO is that the, the tools you need on day one as you're searching for a business model are very different after you found product market fit. Because wait a minute, now I'm still searching. No, no, no. Now we need you to build you know, organizations and teams and scale and, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, chief revenue officer and all, all the things that you were experimenting with. Now you need a different set of at least 
a different set of skills. And often that means a different set of people. And your co-founder or even you say, well, wait a minute, my business card says X. It doesn't matter what your business card says. It matters what the company needs for that next stage. And if you don't get there, that is, if you don't get those skills, the company's going to fail. But usually you don't tell founders, oh, your job, it might be obsolete in nine months mm. or two years. Yeah. And, and, and so just remembering it's not a job for life. The goal of a startup is not to become a startup. The goal of a startup is to become a large company. So a startup definition, at least for me, a startup is a temporary organization designed to search for repeatable and scalable business model. That is, if you think about it, the goal is not to have a place where you could bring your dogs and have free food and, or work virtually for the rest of your life. I mean, it might be, but that's not the goal. Because if that is the goal, what you've just defined is a small business. And it might be, okay, you might want to be a small business, but if you want something at scale, it's going to have to search for a repeatable model to get large. Sorry for taking us off, no, off track. No, not at all, not at all. Um, Steve, I want to actually talk about venture capital at the moment because one of the things I'm acutely aware of and I wrote about it in my book is that there's this Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley rather narrative uh, if you go to TechCrunch, for instance, you'll see all these like headlines, like blah, 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 startup raises X amount of money valued at this. And it's like, there's a whole, you know, if you're from Silicon Valley and you know this place very well, it's like, it's, it's capital driven. Um, and what, um, what my point of view is, is that, you know, it, it's, there's a right time to raise money and there's a wrong time to, to kind of raise money. Um, and um, people shouldn't define their success on how much capital you raise. Um, they should find define success as an example, the one that you I really like the way that you described it so eloquently and that it's about finding the business model right behind the startup to get it to work. That's really what success should be as a startup, not how much money you raise. That's almost like a consequence <laughs> of the business model success that you found. Um, but um, venture capital is, a, I get asked a lot, when should I raise money? So I'm going to ask you because I know my audience is very interested in, in what you'd have to say on this subject, but when should you raise money and when shouldn't you raise money? Yeah, and I'll start with why should you raise money? I mean, that's probably <laughs> the first question. Yeah, yeah, right? exactly, I mean, right? Why? why? Right? So yeah. Why should you raise money? And, yeah. and, and, and I just want to remind folks, you could be an entrepreneur but not need capital. Um, and, and it took me a long time to understand that there are various kinds of businesses entrepreneurs could be in. And, and, and let me give you a quick taxonomy because I grew up just in one world, not realizing the rest, right? So you could be a lifestyle entrepreneur. That is in, in California, you know, I live on the coast and, and there are people who just, they want to spend their entire life surfing in the water, literally right near me. But to pay the rent, they have to, you know, make some money. So they give surf lessons and their little sign on their shack that says surf lessons, 9 a.m. to 10, 15. And the rest of the day, they're in the water. And so, you know, they have their own business. They're entrepreneurial. They get customers and whatever, but they don't want to hire anybody. I mean, you know, they're, it's a lifestyle business, but they are entrepreneurs. Number two is in the United States, this is 99.5% or more of businesses are small business entrepreneurs. That is, they have, you know, marketing consulting firms, or they open restaurants, or they open something else, or, and, and their goal is to feed the family. And, and can they raise venture capital? Not even close, but they could raise maybe money from relatives and maybe they could take out a bank loan or, or you know, a government loan, et cetera. And they are kind of the mainstream of capitalism in almost every uh, company and uh, country in Western democracy. But can they hire the best and the brightest from across the world? No, they hire relatives or local people or whatever. And can they scale? Maybe, but that's not really their goal. Maybe they'll open two restaurants or something in town or, you know, the rare one will open a franchise, but, but, but that wasn't their goal. But the third and fourth ones are the ones we're talking about and your audience is list, listening for is, is what I call scalable startups. Those who really want to knock it out of the park about they want to grow large and in fact, build something that makes a difference that maybe millions of people use or, or you know, generates lots of revenue like tens or hundreds of millions of dollars. Well, those are the ones that, and now that we get to the why, that actually require outside capital. And they also require kind of the best and the brightest, not just from your neighborhood or your city, but maybe from across the world. 
Well, that's a different scale. But by the way, everything I just described is run by an entrepreneur. But now we're talking about a very different business model for this, for this class of startups. And so now the question is, is how much capital, that is how much money do I need to raise to not just start my business, but to scale it? Mm. It's a big idea. You might be able to start a web startup in your parents' basement, um, but to scale it, you know, if it works, you might need $100 million. Whoa. Um, and, and that's an interesting conundrum because today, in almost every city and country in the world, you could probably find angel investors, that is not professional VCs, but, but people who will write you initial checks. But maybe you can't find people because there's still only about 10 or maybe 20 places in the world where you could raise north of 100 million US dollars. Um, and so where are those areas? Um, and so to answer your question of like, should I raise money? It's first you should ask the question, am I a small business or am I something that would appeal to venture capitalists? And because I've seen a lot of impedance mismatches, that is, you think you have a great business that might someday make <gasps> $10 million. <laughs> well, well, if I'm a world-class VC, like that's a pass before I'll even have a meeting. I, I mean, I'm looking for things that could scale to billions or at least have a potential to do that. And it doesn't mean you have a bad business. That's the other big idea. $10 million might be great for a different class of funders. Maybe there are different venture capitalists whose goal or not to make a billion dollars, that the $10 million business is quite fine, thank you. Mm. So one is to understand you know, why you need money, how much money you need, who you need it from, um, and, and then when you need it. Does that answer some of your question or? 100%, I actually wrote about this. I wrote about scale and I mentioned the Silicon Valley nar narrative. And I wrote, I actually spoke about um, you know, lifestyle businesses because what does scale actually mean? You know, to you, like, as because your version of scale, Steve, is most definitely different to mine, for That's sure, right. for Absolutely. sure, for sure. Like, I would, I would, I ha actually hate the idea of raising a hundred million dollars. I hate that because I know what that means for me as the founder. Because now it's a whole different animal. Now it's you need ten x, twenty x return on your on on the money. And you know what, Steve? Like, I've learned about myself uh, just in the last three years, especially you know, with my group, um, is that I don't want a big team. I really don't want a big team. I'm not a guy who who enjoys the cultural, uh, you know, stuff and like having to motivate people every day and dealing with all the human emotion and all that kind of stuff. Like I'm a see the gap in the market, commercialize the gap, build stuff. That's it. Like, and so now my new rule is <laughs> that if I can't have my whole team at, at my house for lunch, there's too many people. So I don't mind having a big business. That's a great I don't mind having a big business, really. Like, I'm a total capitalist. Like, if I could have a billion-dollar unicorn, like, I would absolutely do that. But I would hand over the keys to someone who deals with high-growth startups and go, listen, I'm out. I'm a founder. You know, I'm not a scale. Like, it's the old, um, you know, uh, Steve Jobs. He's the innovator. Like, he was the innovator. The ability to commercialize something, build products, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then, um, uh, you know, and now it's a very different story, right? It's a different type of on CEO that's required. I mean, right. and in many cases, the VCs are gonna give you $100 million. They go, have you run a $100 million company? Or in fact, this at this point, it's probably like a $500 million valued company. Have you run that before? You know, and maybe you're not the right person to do it. So I think you what, what you just described is again, this this taxonomy problem is that the, the, the blogs out there like TechCrunch and whatever are, are talking about a different class of company than what most people want to build. And, and, f and the danger is falling into the trap thinking, oh, that's who I need to be versus no, no, no. You know, taking home a million dollars a year might actually be quite good for me and my family. And it doesn't have to be at that scale. That's what you just described. And, and I think what we need to do is give permission to all the entrepreneurs around the world, the other 99%, that says, no, that's a good thing. You are an entrepreneur. No, it's not like you're not good enough. You're actually smarter because like you're probably going to succeed more often than the people swinging for the fences. Um, and, and I think just keeping in mind, again, there's a, it's not that one is better than another. I, I also got tired when, when companies got to a certain scale, I said, 
wait a minute, I'm now the HR manager, you know, the human resources manager, because I'm dealing with other people's problems all day, rather than the fun part that it was yeah. that I enjoyed when the company was small. Um, so yeah, I think just understanding that, that, um, that yes, you are a real entrepreneur. It's just that making sure that the resources you're trying to get, whether it's capital or people, etc., match the scale of the company you're trying to build. That's just the biggest trap that, that no, you're not going to, if, if you're going to make a million dollars or $5 million a year, trust me, Sequoia Capital is not investing in you, but it doesn't mean that you don't have a good business model and you shouldn't pursue that. Mm, yeah. You know, and I think it's also being real about like who you are, like what kind of a founder are you, you know, you uh, and, and keep interrogating that. And obviously you're not going to have all the answers, but you'll find them eventually. But success means different things to different people. So, so Steve, if I may ask you, just going to wrap up a few more questions. Uh, but what does success mean to you as Steve Blank? Wrap us, give me the elevator pitch on that one. Well, success now is, is a lot different than when success when I first came to Silicon Valley. I'll kind of bookend it. When, you know, I spent four years uh, in, in the Air Force during uh, Vietnam, a year and a half in Southeast Asia before I came to Silicon Valley. And um, I remember joining my first startup. I was living in a house with other people and my, my roommate at the time was working for a large company. And I still remember he said, boy, a startup, isn't that like incredibly risky? And I said, you don't understand. For me, I just came from a place where risk meant you could die. You, you really can't. Am I missing something? But when, I don't think you could die here, which by the way, I think always gave me an edge in, in the Valley because I was literally fearless. I mean, in terms of my career, I'm afraid of a lot of things, but it wasn't a, my career wasn't one of them because I had a bookend to understand what failure really meant. Um, now in the other half of my life is, um, you, you know, to me, success is uh, being able to get up in the morning and do whatever I want. Mm. Um, and I'm, and because I still have one of those entrepreneurial characteristics, uh, which is very much underplayed, which is intense curiosity about a lot of things. I'm intensely curious and I follow my passion into some very interesting places. You know, the lean methodology, I, why me? Well, I could have retired after my last company and been playing golf for the, with some of my friends are still doing that. That would have been the most boring thing in the world for me. I was just intensely curious about why I thought this was right and no one else got it. And then, you know, I followed my passion into some other places as well. I was a public official in California for seven years. I, I just started a new center at Stanford, the Gordian Knott Center for National Security Innovation with um, a couple other folks to solve some really uh, actually now relevant issues in the, in the Ukraine and other places. Um, and and um, so to me, success is you finally get to do what you want. Um, but in a way that... Uh, in a way that also ties back to some of the things I, that was a thread in my life, and that was service. Um, you know, when you're young, you think that, well, the only people you need to service is you, and then maybe as you get a family, maybe I need to take care of my family. But I've always thought in whatever order you want that you've got to serve somebody, whether it's God, country, community, family, etc. And I've tried my best to serve all um, in different ways and um, at different times. And so while you're having a, a great time doing all these entrepreneurial things, you ought to think about um, what are you giving back at the same time? And so, uh, so that to me has is, is been success as I could kind of look back and say, I've done a lot of interesting things and I've also given back in, in the same way. That's been my experience too. Like when I was you know, 26 years old, you know, coming off the first uh, business that I sold, if you told me I, I could walk on water, I'd believe you. You know, everything was about me. And now I've matured a lot. I'm 40, turning 43 this year. I've got two young kids. Uh, you know, life is most definitely not about me anymore. I'm not the center of my universe. It is all about service. And it is really, um, you know, why I do this show. It's about making a contribution to society, entrepreneurs in my own small way uh, that can ultimately make a difference. So what, you, what you're describing to me, Steve, is most definitely the journey that I've had as well. So, so thank you for that. Um, two more questions, Steve, and then we'll kind of wrap up. Um, I'm trying to think which one to go with here. So let me, let me go with this one. Um, what's, what has been your greatest failure um, and what did you learn from it? Well, I think I described that as a, um, my greatest failure was that video game company. Um, and and I, 
as, as I said, I learned a lot about myself and the, the why I failed there and, and what I owned and should have owned and didn't own. Um, you know, in that particular case, the, the specific failure was hubris, which is a fancy word for believing your own bullshit. Um, so I was a, I was clearly a master of that. And, and um, you know, and it's, uh, you know, uh, it, 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 it really changed the trajectory of not only me, but the outcome of maybe every other startup in the world. Someone would have come up with lean, but, but that was its motivation. Mm. Um, there was a second part of the question. Uh, that was uh, and what did you learn from it? Yeah. Yeah, that was, yeah I, I think I answered that with the, you yeah. know, a, a lot about myself and, and that, what it created. Cool. Uh, Steve, if you could get, if you if, if I could give you a time machine, so I'm going to arrive in California, give you a time machine. If you could get into that time machine and go back to yourself when you're like 21 years old and you were to give yourself one piece of advice about life, what would that piece of advice be? You, you know, I, I think um, probably about life, if I had to pick any of it, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, undo any of it because um, it was one hell of a ride. <laughs> Just <laughs> like an amazing time. Um, but I think treat people nice. You know, there are people of different caliber, different competence, different um, points of view, different whatever, um, whether you're working with them or whether they're jerks or whatever that sh the jerk in the room shouldn't be you um and you know boy i i certainly was that person for a while uh, because you know w w one of the key characteristics of a world-class entrepreneur is that no is just the beginning of a conversation um uh, you know well that's great but and because it, it's a maybe a, a description of being relentless um but it doesn't mean you have to leave people behind or, or make them feel bad about it as well. Uh, so probably the, the, the biggest thing I would change was um, um, how I treated people. And, um, um, you know, hopefully some of it's changed, uh, but that's probably the best advice I would have given myself. Yeah, I wish you gave me that advice when I was 21 because I was a complete, I still have I've calmed down a lot, um, but I was a completely right. militant almost because it was do or do we don't try it you know <laughs> so but to your point like and that's one, of the, yeah. one of the characteristics of a great entrepreneur it's that but you really don't need to burn all the bridges yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> right that's exactly right steve last question and we'll let you go um but why do you do what you do uh what gets you out of bed in the morning well the world is a really interesting place um you know i uh I got a call from somebody I hadn't heard from in, in, I can't tell you how long, but it was, I served with them in the military in, in Southeast Asia. And they had somehow looked me up on, on Google and whatever. And, and we caught up and we told each other stories that even if my kids heard today, they're <laughs> like, I, I would deny that, <laughs> that they were true. And, and then I started listening to his life. Um, and, and this was someone who had gotten the same training as me, who was smarter than me, who had, you know, grown up in a great family and whatever. And, but his life had a much different trajectory and that's okay. Different people. And he was happy about it and whatever, but, but every, every time he talked about where his life kind of went South and it wasn't a, wasn't a great ending. He would say, well, I guess that's how it was supposed to be. And, and I just found that the most depressing conversation ever. I, and, and the reason why is because I don't believe that's how it's supposed to be. You know, we live for a short period of time and just accepting that, you know, here are the rules and this is, this is what you're supposed to do and you can't change anything or, or you can't create new rules or create new value or, or make things better for people. I think that's a very depressing life. Um, so I live the life like, well, okay, here's the status quo, but it doesn't have to be the status quo. And, and I'm curious about a lot of things and I'll, I'll see if I could change them or, or make a difference or, or learn about them, et cetera. And so, uh, so I, I, I guess for me, the, the thing is, is that don't accept what's handed to you. Um, you know, be unreasonable about wanting to change things for the better, not just for change, but change for the better. And, and if we all did that, we'd, we'd have a much more interesting and, and certainly um, a better place to, to live for all of us. So that's probably the, the thing I'd leave you with. That's quite a bombshell. 
Uh, Steve Blank, you're a, you're a wise soul, and that's what I love about you. Um, Steve, thank you so much for being on the show. It's been a real privilege and uh, an honor having you on the show. Uh, thank you, everybody, for sticking around. Um, obviously, this uh, has been a really amazing conversation. But um, thank you once again. Without you guys, the show wouldn't be what it is. So thank you once again, Steve. It's been a real honor. Thanks, Matt. This was a great conversation. Cheers, mate.